So um, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, and um, he is the director of Sousa Labs. Uh, go ahead and set up if you want. <laughs> we had him set up. Um, and, and so we've talked, uh, we've talked about uh, bringing in the keynote speaker, uh, having the conference here in Prague, and, and of course, he's right here, Sousa Labs, uh, as the director. And so please welcome uh, Vortek Pavlok. Pavlok? <laughs> Pavlik, but Pavlik. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm quite grateful you managed my first name right, so that doesn't usually happen. No. Will I get a HDMI? Yes, fine. Does the presentation. So, uh, yes, I was actually asked to do a keynote, and uh, I hate doing keynotes, uh, because keynotes are supposed to be witty and funny and, and all that, and that's really hard. Uh, and I don't even know enough about OpenSUSE and the community, unfortunately, because I'm kind of a little bit from the other side, right? I'm, I definitely am very much uh, a community guy, because I started as a kernel engineer in SUSE years ago. Actually, we'll go there um, in, in my talk. But uh, I have not been involved in the actual distro building work much, mainly coding. So um, I thought, well, maybe I could talk about how uh, it all looks from the enterprise side of things that yeah, I'm mainly involved in, in my work. Um, and hopefully it will be a little bit funny at least. <laughs> so. Um, it all started, as you all know, in 1992 when SUSE was founded. Uh, the chameleon looked the wrong way, and uh, <laughs> the dots were between the letters and all that. And I actually, I have to add one thing, uh, and that is due to a popular demand by some of the organizers, uh, I need to also say here that uh, the founding of SUSE actually happened in an Indian restaurant in Erlangen. <laughs> Now, th that was still way ahead of my time at SUSE, right? So I joined only a couple of years later when one manager from SUSE actually knocked on my door in Prague and asked, well, do you want to work for SUSE? And I said, well, what is it? Uh, <laughs> and he said, well, we are a Linux company and we would like you to do what you do, just we'll pay you for it. Um, you keep hacking USB and we are fine. So yes, I said, hmm, that's good. Why not? Let's do that. And so I joined SUSE in 1999. And since I was hacking on USB, uh, and um, it was kind of researchy stuff, I thought, okay, I'll call my work something. And so I created this banner up there, SUSE Labs. It's, it's, it's pixelated. It's, it's like, quite, oh, actually, the projector doesn't show it that badly, but it's quite ugly because all the word was pixelated back then. Um, and that was about April, it was May 99, uh, when I created that banner and, and put, it, put up a web page on my university computer. Um, and then a month later, well, two months later in July, actually that announcement came out. SUSE found SUSE Labs. Uh, I was like, what? Uh, okay, I'm already in there. <laughs> That's good. And it was all about how SUSE is investing into Linux research and, and, and very uh, businessy uh, press announcement. But um, yeah, excuse me for using the laser pointer. But this bit in red actually changed the future of everything. Because Holger Dirov, back then the head of SUSE, actually also said that thanks to doing all that research and having all the uh, clever people there, maybe I was included, uh, we can do level three support for customers. And that was something that was not on the market really back then. I mean, Red Hat was dabbling in that as well, but thinking about really doing support for paying customers all the way to actually fixing any bug that gets thrown at you, thrown at you was kind of unknown and that changed the course of SUSE because still, even in 2000, uh, and that is only later, SUSE's main business was selling boxes, right? 
the value of SUSE was that we took all the various bits of software that were floating out there in the open source sea of packages, well, actually not packages, right? Source code, uh, tarballs, and created a, a distro out of that and put it on shelves in computer stores and supermarkets. And our salespeople were actually fighting for shelf space. It's, it's just something that's kind of unbelievable in, in, in today's world, uh, where you can download everything, so yeah, there is no software on shelves, on shelves anyway. Um, and it was not really doing that great anymore, because yes, internet was getting faster and everybody was downloading stuff, so why the hell would somebody go to a store to actually buy a box? I mean, there was manual. We had a big documentation department. We were quite proud of it. We still have a great documentation department, but they are focusing a little bit on different stuff than creating paper books, which was actually the main content of that box. So, the thing that changed it was IBM. And IBM back then requested us, well, you have this nifty Linux distro, and we have this Grand new Z900 first, or actually second 64 bit mainframe in the world. And we are toying with the idea. Actually, one of our engineers a year ago did port Linux to it. Maybe you could create a distro for it, but it would need to be enterprise quality. And so we just took what we'd had, slapped a sticker on it, saying enterprise. And that was it, right? The first SLES was born in, 19, uh, in 2000. It didn't really have a version number. It was just the SLES for, for Z series, for IBM. It was not really shipped many times or sold many times, but, but, but the, the name was born at least. I mean, we, before we had all other kinds of acronyms like uh, SUSE Linux Standard Server and SUSE Linux Professional and SUSE Linux uh, Personal and whatever slocks was, open exchange, and, and there was also like a school server and, and all that. But this one kind of became the destiny. Um, and started shaping SUSE a lot. SUSE back then was still mainly doing the distro, so that, the thing that originally was SUSE Linux, later was open SUSE, uh, and then using that to create the SLESs, like SLES 8, that actually took a long time to find that screenshot. Um, nobody has SLES 8 screenshots anymore. This actually is not a SLES 8 screenshot anymore. It is a United Linux one, which was SLES 8 based, and it actually was having a chameleon in there, all the, uh, because nobody noticed and somebody forgot to remove it, to brand it um, as, as United Linux. Uh, so SLES 8 was like the first big SLES that was shipped across architectures. It actually supported even Itanium back then. It was a lot of effort. And the way that SUSE created it, and also a number of subsequent SLESs, was that um, we took the dot one release of uh, either first SUSE Linux, then later OpenSUSE. So the idea was that we released the dot zero, it is all fresh and new and somewhat buggy, and then people use it, and then um, through that we find bugs, and once it's reasonably stable, we do the dot one release, let it run for a while, see if it's stable, and then rebrand that as SLES with additional things. And that was the problem. That was the problem that was becoming painful because there were these enterprisey things like support for, I don't know, multipath, or, or even the Itanium and Z series, because um, only a few people would probably want to have those next to their desk uh, at home. Well, maybe more percentage than in the usual population would be in this room, but still, um, that's kind of unusual. So the, the, the problem was always making sure that in the next SLES release we have all those bits again, because they were not going back into OpenSUSE, really. Um, and then we changed it a little bit in SLES 11, SLES 12, where there was factory born, and OpenSUSE was branching of factory, and SLES was branching of factory, and, and that carried us quite well for, for some time, but actually creating SLES 12 was extremely, SLES 12 GA was extremely painful. Not many people would remember it anymore because it, it's a thought well hidden in their brains, but... <laughs> 
But it was tough, right? Uh, it, was, it was tough because, again, that same problem happened again. We just branched our factory and we lost all that hardening from uh, the previous less 11 that went in all that enterprise work was totally lost because, and that was the problem, right? Slice 11 was branched off from factory and then Slice 11 service pack one was developed from the GA version and service pack two was developed from the service pack, service pack two was developed from service pack one and so on. So actually none of those changes were really going back into factory. And so when we branched off C12, we were basically starting an enterprise Linux from scratch again. And obviously, that, that's going to hurt. So, um, and there we are getting like to um, the main or my funniest bit of the presentation. Um, that was so bad that it actually made me to create a silly story that I presented in a whole hands back then. And I'm, I'm actually going to show you the pictures from that silly story. Not actually all the narrative word by word because it was really kind of uh, childish, but it, it did have the impact that was required, right? So it was called The Tale of Two K Millions. And yeah, excuse the, the style because it was actually drawn in like 10 minutes ahead of that presentation back then because I kind of tend to prepare these things at the very last minute. Um, and it was started at, well, there were two chameleons. One was, well, actually, I will skip the names because I don't want them to catch on. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, one was representing SLES and the other one was representing OpenSUSE, right? And SLES was like the somewhat more sedentary type while, while OpenSUSE was more adventurous. And then, well, the hard times can, came on on that household. Uh, and that was actually uh, a representation of the real our financial crisis that was hitting the industry quite badly at that time and actually forced SUSE to do a lot of changes. Uh, it was, I mean, up until, um, up until the 10 times, or it's less than 10 times, uh, we actually had a massive department that was called the Open SUSE department that was primarily charged with creating Open SUSE. And then there was the, the enterprise department that were taking that and turning it into nice and shiny enterprise stuff. Uh, in the financial crisis, we actually, well, had to focus on surviving. So a lot of those open source people were, well, rebranded as packages or, or actually taken into other roles inside of the enterprise part. And we said, okay, yes, uh, we will give full control to open, of open source to the community, which has happened, which is an absolutely, well, it was absolutely great step, even though it was a little bit forced by the economic climate. Um, and, just have a small group that will be like helping that effort. Uh, so that happened and kind of, yeah, that was described by, well, adding the uh, other guy, the, the, the small and more adventurous guy, letting him free and, and, and roaming the hills, really. Um, while the other, other one said, stayed at home, the, the house was actually, well, badly damaged. And back then we had to lay off a lot of people, so it really was kind of painful. Uh, but the guy that was at home, the, the, slice, the slice came in, and he was actually doing quite well. And over the time, over the various acquisitions that SUSE went through, um, we became profitable and we became growing. And, well, he, or she maybe, actually turned into a kind of a cash cow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, while OpenSUSE was not really that thriving, I mean, it, 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 thanks to being lean and, 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 and uh, yeah, agile, I would say agile, um, there were a lot of changes in how OpenSUSE was, was done, right? There, there were the staging projects and CI introduced and the build service was enhanced a lot. And, and suddenly, with, even with small resources, with not so much investment from the company, uh, OpenSUSE was really a great doing viable project. And yeah, SLES wasn't, right? SLES 12 was painful. So there was something broken uh, in the way that we were doing SLES. This is an image where, well, he can't even fit into the house anymore. <laughs> so he has to be in the front porch, but there is a fence because he is kind of afraid of doing anything more radical. Um, 
And so we knew that we have to change how we develop SLAS back then. And um, well, the idea was that we turn OpenSUSE not into the like collection of packages that is uh, tested by the community that, that we provide the packages for and we get the testing because that value was not really there anymore if we uh, would just uh, ignore giving the code back because it was not the enterprise code that was tested anymore. It was the, uh, that was the community code that was tested. Um, so, so how to be able to give more and to get more? And the thing that uh, SLES was obviously missing was the agile infrastructure of the continuous integration and the staging projects and the testing that was done on that. That was a great thing that SLES could gain. But what could it, what could it give it back? What, what it could give back was the question. So uh, that presentation actually concluded with this nice happy end picture. And after that came the technical part. So the question was, what's, what's happening, right? Will they be able to live together? Will they be able to te learn from each other and actually change the way how SLES is developed? And maybe uh, actually uh, OpenSUSE can get again more from SUSE uh, as uh, well the business part of it. So, yeah, was that the end? Well, actually not. A lot of things happened since that. This, this presentation was presented by me in, uh, what, is, what was it, uh, 2014. And yes, uh, a lot of those changes were already ripe, as in um, OpenSUSE had the technology developed, uh, SLAS actually needed a change in direction. Uh, it was not that uh, I, I would, uh, well, invent the idea of what to do. It was just like putting the things together and pointing a finger on it. So, yeah, the technical slide is this. Uh, it's just one of the many that were presented. This is an idea of how development should be done, uh, that actually if we are working on the next sleep project, we should get those packages into factory first, or ideally if there are changes that, uh, that even are inside the packages to get to the upstream project first, get it into development branch after a CI test, it would be merged into factory or tumbleweed as we know it today. And then after additional uh, product QA, it would be accepted into SLES and, and distributed. And this is mostly happening. There were tweaks and changes and, uh, and so on, but it's actually doing pretty well. Now, the thing that the, the enterprise side of, of SUSE could give back was, of course, the enterprise distribution, because there is competition. There is CentOS, uh, there is um, Ubuntu LDS, uh, those are distributions were, which cater to the needs of people that don't want to live on the bleeding edge, right? Um, so, and, and that's what the market, or what the market, what the community is shifting. I mean, I at home am using OpenSUSE on many machines, and I don't want to upgrade them every Tuesday. Although it gives me like the feeling that yes, I have the greatest version of packages and, and so on, but my wife that is running statistical analysis for her work on those machines is kind of complaining, oh, you upgraded my darn library versions again. I'll have to recompile my stuff. So yeah, uh, what if we could have a community distro that has all the benefits of the enterprise distro? Well, and, and that's what Leap is, really. And initially, there was quite a bit of change, quite a bit of difference between Leap and and uh, and, and Slash, particularly in the times of uh, SLE 12, or with the Leap 42 series. The kernel was different, a lot of config was different. But uh, with 15, we actually finally achieved parity uh, OpenSUSE was developed together with, with SLAS pretty much at the same pace. Even the kernel is shared. You get all that stability, all that immense amount of testing that goes into SLAS today because, yes, we were not sleeping on the SLAS side either. We were adding a lot more brute force machine power into testing by using OpenQA, by actually expanding the test, uh, test setups. So that we could have 
what is today perceived as enterprise history, right? There is a big difference between the first slides, which was just an additional sticker, and, and today's history, which where you really have high demands of stability and performance and all that. So when we are take a in the labs, when we take a Linux kernel, it takes us more than a year, probably almost two years, uh, to get it to the level of performance and stability that is actually acceptable for enterprise use. Uh, and it's, 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 it's more than a year of quite heavy work because the next time we take a look at the upstream kernel is broken again. Uh, we do push all the changes back, of course, and we get upstream to perform, but there are more people working on that that focus more on features and supporting new hardware and that always has a detrimental effect on the overall performance. So that's now getting going into Leap as well. So yeah, from my pure selfish view, I'll be very happy to have that on my, on my home desktop. And yeah, that's pretty much the whole story of the, today's keynote. Leap. It will be announced today that we have a Leap 15. So hooray <laughs> and thank you.